Welcome to Heroes Keep Gaming. In today's video, I'm taking a look at the recently leaked 2001 build of Duke Nukem Forever. This is the version of the game that was unveiled in the classic E3 2001 trailer, which resulted in Duke Nukem Forever reaching peak levels of hype following its initial announcement in 1997. Unfortunately, this build of the game, much like the one that preceded it, would never be completed for commercial release. After nearly 10 years, seemingly being delayed indefinitely, and moving to a new game engine for, I believe, the fourth time, Duke Nukem Forever was finally released commercially in 2011 to a generally poor response from fans and critics alike. So the question on everyone's mind is, will this leaked build finally show us if a better Duke Nukem Forever game has been hidden away all these years on a hard drive somewhere? I'm going to give a rundown of how much game is actually included in this leak and my assessment of whether what we have here is the Duke game fans were betting on 20 years ago. This version of the game from October 26, 2001 runs on the Unreal Tournament version of the original Unreal Engine, which added improved networking for online multiplayer, though it was still considered Unreal Engine 1. This is notable because it was the cause of one of many delays for Duke Nukem Forever. The game started development on the Quake 2 engine, then was scrapped and moved to the earlier version of Unreal Engine seen in the first Unreal game. It was then scrapped a third time and started over once again in the Unreal Tournament version so that its multiplayer component would be on par with the competition. It's difficult to find information on exactly which engine was used for the final version of Duke Nukem Forever that was commercially released in 2011, but from what I can see it ran on a heavily modified version of Unreal Engine 2.5 which likely incorporated some features from Unreal Engine 3 without switching to that engine entirely. For comparison, Bioshock 1 and 2 also used a heavily modified version of Unreal Engine 2.5, so it wasn't completely unheard of and could certainly result in fantastic games even a few years after Unreal Engine 3 became the industry standard. But I'll discuss that in more detail when I compare this version of the game to the 2011 official release. What's exciting about this leak is that for years it was said that the 2001 build of the game wasn't actually playable. The assumption was that it was comprised of assets designed specifically to create the E3 2001 trailer. This belief was reinforced in a great Wired.com article in 2009 titled Learn to Let Go, How Success Killed Duke Nukem. At this time, it seemed Duke Nukem Forever would never be released due to development being halted and a lawsuit between 3D Realms and publisher Take-Two Interactive. In the article, they interviewed several former developers of the game anonymously. One of those developers was quoted as saying, When they were brought onto the project in the year 2000, they remembered being very impressed by the features. It was incredibly cool technology, but it wasn't a game. It was more like a series of tech demos in a very chaotic state. Now that we're able to play the 2001 build for ourselves, we can see that statement is fairly true, even from this iteration of the game a year later. Though there are more playable levels here than expected, none of them are complete. You can't progress through most of the levels without using console commands to clip through the environment. However, it does give us a good idea of the game it could have been had it shipped in 2002 or 2003. What's most surprising is how similar many of the elements of this build of the game are to the one that actually shipped to retailers in 2011. The story is fairly similar, with small details changed for the final release, and as a result the levels that are included take place in many of the same locations, with some sections even looking nearly identical. The most striking example of this is the opening level in Duke's penthouse. The Vegas skyline full of towering casinos, and a facsimile of the famous Bellagio Fountain is almost the same in both versions of the game, though in the 2001 build this sequence takes place during a thunderstorm at night, while the building itself is under attack. This makes it look even more impressive in this early version of the game, as we can see all of the Vegas lights illuminated in the distance, and impressively advanced weather effects, as the environment around you is destroyed and filled with fire and shattering glass. The 2011 version may make more sense for the story, and it is easier to get accustomed to interactive elements like the pool table when your entire screen isn't shaking. But the 2001 version is undeniably more impressive and cooler looking. 
In general, the 2011 release's environments look more bland and generic than the striking, vibrant colors and intricate details on display in this early build of the game. That's not to say this 2001 build is outright better than the 2011 game. I've seen many comments jumping to that conclusion after seeing just a few minutes of this build. Whenever we see a piece of entertainment that was never released, it seems there's this instinctive reaction to automatically believe it would have been the best thing ever, simply because we never got to experience it. But that's a pretty big leap to make from the limited content available here. If anything, playing this build of the game has actually made me more appreciative of the version of Duke Nukem Forever that was officially released, because it delivers these ideas that were mostly rough sketches in the 2001 build in a complete, refined, and fully playable state, which is something I admit I took for granted when I first played DNF 2011. But really, there are pros and cons to both versions. The curse of Duke Nukem Forever that runs through every iteration of the game is that 3D Realm's main focus was copying features from every new game that came out, instead of simply translating the core tenets of Duke Nukem 3D that make it fun to play even 25 years later to a new game engine. Still, to 3D Realm's credit, we can see in the trailers that they did some innovative things with each engine they used throughout Duke Nukem Forever's development. The 98 trailer had some amazing looking turret sequences, far beyond anything else I'd seen done in the Quake 2 engine. In this 2001 build, the shattering glass in the first level is more advanced than anything I recall seeing done in games at the time. They incorporated fully functioning touchscreens like those that were made famous in Doom 3, years before that game had likely started development. There are also touchscreen puzzles like we saw in Bioshock in 2007. The way Duke is able to pick up the switch to control hydraulic lifts is also more advanced than anything similar at the time. Most of these features didn't make it into the final release of Duke Nukem Forever, likely because other games had already popularized them and they would no longer be impressive. It's a shame Duke wasn't able to release first and get the credit for these innovations, but I think it was the right call for the 2011 release to streamline its design by cutting out these elements that would have no longer been viewed as original. Many of the pros and cons between the 2001 build and the 2011 retail release come down to the fact that more games had released, which introduced more modern shooter features 3D Realms felt the need to copy, making key aspects of the game worse with each iteration. In the 2001 build, you can carry all of Duke's weapons at once, which is far more true to the old school shooter style of Duke 3D, and is much more fun. The only reason for this is likely because the modern realistic shooter trope of limiting your inventory to only a couple weapons at a time wasn't popularized until the release of Halo, which interestingly released just a few short weeks after this build was created. Of course, the 2011 release of Duke Nukem Forever copied Halo's inventory limitation, and it's a feature that needlessly makes combat less fun and varied. Similarly, the 2001 build has medkits and MREs you can pick up in crates to heal yourself, while the 2011 release has automatically regenerating health because it had become the modern standard. This also makes combat a lot less fun. Instead of constantly being on the run in search of health items, you're forced to find cover and hide from the action after being shot a few times, so you can wait the several seconds it takes for your health or ego bar to regenerate. The 2001 build also has you running at all times, and it feels much more true to the old-school run-and-gun style of the series. 2011 adopts the use of a dedicated sprint button, so you'll spend most of the game walking at a casual pace through gunfights, and then sprinting to the next gunfight so you can, again, casually walk around as you exchange gunfire with enemies. These three modernizations to the inventory, health, and movement systems are the antithesis of how a Duke game should play, and make the combat in the final release of Duke Nukem Forever significantly less fun and old school than that which is present in the 2001 build. As I think every reviewer pointed out at the time, the fact that Duke cracks jokes about Master Chief in the 2011 release of Duke Nukem Forever while copying that series features to its own detriment is the pinnacle of a lack of self-awareness. While the 2001 build's combat is faster and more frenzied, feeling more true to the series' legacy, the combat is still the most fun part of Duke Nukem Forever 2011, and there are some things the 2011 version does better. Duke Nukem Forever 2011 has you battling all of Duke's classic foes for the duration of the game, and it's much better for it. 
The enemies in the 2001 version are EDF soldiers who are infected by an alien, like John Carpenter's The Thing. It's admittedly pretty cool when you kill them and their heads detach, sprout spider legs, and continue to attack you, just like in the classic scene from the film. But overall, fighting human soldiers is way too derivative of Half-Life, and not nearly as interesting as battling Duke's iconic enemies. Infected EDF soldiers could have been an interesting concept for a single level to add some variety but they're just about the only enemy you'll face in the 2001 build of the game. Though there is an Unreal Engine remake of the first level of Duke 3D that's included in this leak, possibly to test how similarly the game plays in the new engine. And that one is populated with all of the classic enemies as it should be. It's also the perfect example of what 3D Realm's goals should have been for Duke Nukem Forever. My conclusion, having played through the content available in this 2001 build of the game, is that Duke Nukem Forever was ill-conceived from the start. By straying too far from the core tenets that make Duke 3D one of the most fun FPS games of all time, it never had a chance at being a worthy successor. But it's interesting to imagine. Would I have enjoyed this game in the unlikely scenario that it was completed and released on PlayStation 2 back in 2002? It's hard to say for sure due to unknown factors like the level of polish and optimization that could have been added in that time, but I was also much less critical of games back then. I also have to factor in my personal anticipation level for Duke Nukem Forever. I was a Duke fanatic growing up. Even though I wasn't a PC gamer until the late 90s, I owned Duke Nukem 3D on both Sega Saturn and N64, and it had to be my most played game on both consoles. I also owned the awesome resource action figures that came out in 1998, and I also really enjoyed the third-person spin-offs, Duke Nukem Zero Hour on N64, and even though I didn't own it, I had a blast playing Duke Nukem Time to Kill on PS1 at my best friend's house. But everyone knew Duke Nukem Forever was the true follow-up to Duke Nukem 3D. I remember having the December 1999 issue of PC Gamer Magazine, which had a Duke Nukem Forever cover story and an article that featured a bunch of screenshots from the game. Even though the launch of the Dreamcast and my excitement over the flurry of games releasing for that console had taken most of my attention around that time, I still couldn't wait for more Duke. So back to a hypothetical 2002 release date. As someone who mostly played games on PS2 at that time, Following the Dreamcast's sudden and sad demise, my favorite FPS games released in 2002 were Red Faction 2, Medal of Honor Frontline, and there were a couple other notable releases I didn't play until later, like Time Splitters 2, which is the highest rated of all of these titles on Metacritic, and Turok Evolution, which was critically panned and is certainly not as good as the N64 originals, but I personally had a lot of fun playing it. Among critics, I could see a completed version of this build of Duke Nukem Forever scoring better than Turok Evolution, but definitely lower than Time Splitters 2, Medal of Honor Frontline, and my personal favorite of these games, Red Faction 2. I imagine this iteration of Duke scoring somewhere in the low 70s on Metacritic. So in other words, getting like a 7 out of 10 from most reviewers. As far as how I would personally rate this hypothetical completed release, of Duke Nukem Forever 2001. Despite all of my criticisms, I could honestly see it being among my top three of these titles that I've mentioned, and a game I would have played a lot and gotten a great deal of enjoyment out of. That may seem contradictory of my analysis of the game, but keep in mind Turek Evolution is in my top three PS2 FPS titles released in 2002, and that's objectively a heavily flawed sequel. I am Turok! but it still delivered the kind of over-the-top badass FPS action I enjoy most, and I had a blast playing it. So I think Duke Nukem Forever 2001, had it been finished, would absolutely rank somewhere close to that. In closing, I have to state that, again, my biggest surprise from playing this early build of Duke Nukem Forever was that it gave me a greater appreciation for the final game that was eventually released. Blow it out your ass. Using console commands to clip through sections of these primitive versions of sequences that work seamlessly in the final game 
shows that there was a level of polish added to making it at least a functioning and playable game. It's unfortunate that the 2011 release's combat is dragged down by the inclusion of modern features, but I can still manage to have fun with the combat sequences. What really kills the enjoyment of that final release is even once you learn to enjoy the downgraded combat, it's constantly broken up by scripted sequences that result in repeated unavoidable deaths and excessively long load times. For a series that was once known for non-stop run-and-gun action and fun exploration, the retail release of Duke Nukem Forever has you doing a whole lot of walking along a linear path, waiting for short bursts of not-so-great action to occur. Aside from missing the point of what made Duke Nukem 3D so fun to begin with, Duke Nukem Forever's greatest weakness was time. So it was really interesting to be able to explore this 2001 time capsule of the game that could have been, and see firsthand the pros and cons of both versions of the game. Whether you've played this leaked 2001 build of Duke Nukem Forever, or just learned more about it from this video, I'm interested to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Does the 2001 build seem like it would have been preferable to the final game that was actually released, or do you think it was always destined for disappointment? And what I'm most interested to know is, had the game been released 10 years earlier, how do you think it would have stacked up against your favorite games at the time? This channel is just getting started, so be sure to subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future. And that's going to do it for my thoughts on Duke Nukem Forever 2001. Thanks for watching, and until next time, keep gaming. Ah, uh, much better.